computer. Here we go. So hello and welcome everyone. I'm so excited. FractalU.com is back. <laughs> Thanks to wonderful helpers like Russ and Tufan. And uh, I'm Dan Winter, as you know. And tonight's conversation is Introduction to Cosmic Geometry and Implosion and Entropy. Uh, now, first, what's going to happen is that uh, Russ here, who is the courageous team that led the reinventing of FractalU.com website, is going to say hello for two minutes about his vision for FractalU and also getting involved in the Discord conversation. And then Tufan Guven, who is our official moderator for these series, has a short intro, and he will be involved in arranging the, the conversation and moderating the discussion. So first, Russ, go ahead. Beautiful. Blessings and love to everybody that's here that's uh, joined us on this conversation. I would like to say Happy New Year, and thank you for being here with us to launch Fractal U. The visions and how we see Fractal U be moving uh, from start out is we will like everybody to join us in our Discord channels and our uh, vision for Fractal U to be a more expansive and optimized source of information uh, through Dan Winters information that uh, he has pre presents uh, to the world. So I thank you, everybody. Um, I've, I've been working on this for about almost a half a year. I think it's been since the uh, last time that Dan and I uh, were together physically. And I'm happy that we're all, all able to um, join this meeting. And Tufan, please take it away. Let, but just, let, just briefly, Russ, though, Russ was so brave to create this amazing new front end for FractalU.com website, but give him a very brief how to get involved in the Discord discussion group, very briefly, please. Right, right, right. So, so, so through, through the FractalU website, uh, you will find the Discord channel, uh, the link that you, you can uh, press, you, you join the dis Discord. Um, that will be basically the, the, the main form of... Uh, our discussions, every update, every interview will, uh, of Dan's will be posted on the Discord. Um, through the Facebook channels and through the Instagrams, we will be optimizing how, how to have more of an audience and the, the marketing will be expanded there also. But from uh, FractalU.com, everybody can join the Discord channels. Yeah, so Discord is available. Be, be a beautiful opportunity for discussion, as well as Facebook and Tufan will be helping to moderate that as well. Thank you so much, Russ. Fabulous. And now, Tufan, introduction and uh, moderation. Go ahead, Tufan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Russ. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Tufan Guven, representative at geometricmodels.org, where you can find all sorts of sacred geometry modeling and educational tools. Uh, I will be hosting this beautiful program, starting with today's lecture by Dan Winter, the pioneer of fractal field physics and the main driving force behind FractalU.com. So fractal university programs have been going on for many years now. Multiple experts in this field have taught at FractalU.com and the past recordings are all available on Dan Winter's YouTube channel. We will put up those links here in the chat box and these lectures are also being recorded and they will be published on YouTube as well. So all courses will take place on Sundays at 2 p.m. New York time, 11 a.m. California and 8 p.m. Paris time. And they will take about 90 minutes with open discussion and Q&A is planned at the end of each event. So you can write down your questions at the chat box and we'll go over them at the end of each session. Uh, these lectures are taking place on Zoom and login details for each class are shared online at fractalu.com slash courses. And big thanks to Dan Winter, Patrick Bolt, Valerie Sandalin, and Russ for their contribution to this project. Before moving on to this week's topic, I would like to announce that next week on January 15th, we are meeting with Iris Husing to talk about training with kids to see without their eyes. Bliss, biofeedback training with young people. You can also check flaminmind.com slash autovision. Without further ado, I would like to welcome and give the floor to Dan Winter. 
<laughs> Thank you, Tufan. You know, Tufan's service he provides distributing uh, sacred geometry tools and toys around the world. Uh, we're working closely together, and this provides an ideal teaching media, actually. So that's a, a wonderful service. Thank you, Tufan, for being there. And Tufan was here for our events in France and is a dedicated partner. It's wonderful. Okay, so as everybody knows, I'm Dan Winter, FractalU.com, FractalField.com. And the background is on our 2 million view YouTube channel, where all of these will also appear, youtube.com slash Dan Winter Fractal Field. Tonight's conversation is introductory, uh, introduction to fractal geometry, sacred geometry and implosion and negentropy. Uh, however, I'd like to introduce the con conversation by setting a context for the discussion about sacred geometry. Please, if, if you folks would mute, mute your microphones, it's important with this group that we, we do mute here so we don't have background noise. Thank you. So um, what I wanna say about the study of sacred geometry in general is remember that the study of geometry is essentially ultimately the study of wave mechanics. It has to be because everything is waves, waves of charge, obviously. So the point is that any, study of what geometry is powerful for has to be a study of what charge waves do. Another way to put that is that if you think you're studying science and suddenly it feels like numerology, uh, and there's a legitimate role for pattern recognition, but you can get lost very easily unless you ask the question, have I predicted something that waves will do? If you have then it's not new numerology, it's physics. <laughs> and pattern recognition is important. But you can get lost in pure abstract symbolism and never really get focused on delivering a powerful service of powerful understanding unless we understand that we're talking about wave mechanics. And the most important part of that, which really is the kind of the heading theme behind tonight's slideshow on negentropy implosion and, and the wave mechanics of sacred geometry. The theme tonight is, is charge collapse the answer? Remember, we have been calling it implosion and implosive negentropy for many years. But if you actually review the physics literature, in the physics literature, what we're calling implosion is almost precisely the concept of what is called charge collapse. Now, why is that important? Well, Einstein obviously agonized for most of his life when he could not solve the unified field and discover why an object falls to the ground. He said the solution is perfected charge collapse. He knew that infinite or non-destructive or perfected charge collapse is in fact the solution to his problem. It's obvious because that implosion is what creates the centripetal force. So everyone agrees that charge collapse is the answer what they don't know is what causes charge collapse. And that's what we intend to answer very much specifically with the geometric lesson this evening. Now, the parallel to that is all, virtually all of the scientists who portend to be understood, to study the physics of consciousness today. And we have specific examples, Roger Penrose, uh, uh, Bruce and, and uh, Gary Schwartz, Stuart Hameroff, they, they all agree they either say consciousness causes charge collapse or charge collapse causes consciousness. The, the argument among them is not if charge collapse is important. The ar argument is only does charge collapse cause consciousness or does ch consciousness call, cause charge collapse? But they all agree on the fundamental principle. And asking which is which is sort of like asking is the tornado the vortex or is the vortex the tornado? <laughs> the point is none of them, zero, have seemed to have the first clue, any beginning, any kind of answer to the answer, what causes charge collapse. So if we can accurately describe the cause of charge collapse, hint, fractal conjugate implosive negentropy, we have the specific physics answer to all of their questions, the cause of gravity, the cause of consciousness, and oh, by the way, the reason a seed germinates, the cause of life, is that negentropic implosion, ability to suck in the first, first nutrient. So charge collapse perfected is evidently by agreement of almost all of scientists, charge collapse perfected is 
the cause of gravity, the cause of consciousness, and the cause of life force. Now, the fact that no one on this planet has until, until this, this moment stated what causes charge collapse is the reason for the mystery. And so what we're doing tonight specifically is answering the real physics of the cause of charge collapse, implosive neg entropy. And so as we begin to understand this, what causes this vortex to implode towards center, so many of the important mysteries of what is life, what is gravity are answered. So that's our fun little slideshow. Okay, so here's the slideshow. Hopefully you're seeing my screen. So this slideshow is part, and this has been changed since, but we did a recent series, which was originally prepared with in the lecture series, Climax with, I've done many with Elena Denon, and now I'm beginning with Michael Sala. And of course, they're talking about the, the Star Trek future, but the Star Trek future became the cause of charge collapse as you're about to see. So that's why this slideshow has been modified from that presentation. But as you can see, um, if you wanted to understand the Star Trek future, you need to understand what warp propulsion was, what impulse power was, essentially the mechanics of electrogravity. And you can't understand any of that, of course, unless you know why an object falls to the ground, which obviously is perfected charge collapse. Now, examples we used of that is we understood how that vortex, that mercury vortex in the Vimana Nazi bell, which later became actually the Nazi dark fleet, it was a mercury vortex. Why did that vortex make gravity? If you could think about that for yourself, you would be so empowered. And the advanced version of that is called warp propulsion, which we'll talk about. It's a phase conjugate pump wave in a piezo crystal, the Kosky frost example. So we can understand what warp propulsion is. We understand what a med bed is. We under we're gonna understand stargates and portals using this physics. So the background lectures to that conversation is the six lectures I did for Elena Denon on the physics of the nine galactic bases, how you have a foes fly and how stargates and portals work. And also the work we then did with um, uh, on uh, the French uh, uh, secret space program, uh, Jean-Charles Moyen, which actually we showed how he bilocated. So this is the series upcoming, obviously, fractalview.com. All of you have seen the website, and this is the lecture series. And by the way, uh, in this series, February 12, is, uh, there's a mystery guest planned, and you will see very soon. It's going to be very exciting on, uh, on gravity physics, actually. So and this is a parallel to our project, jedischool.science. So this is, uh, this is the core physics here, which is where you see the geometry of the perfect vortex which this slide was prepared before we proved this is literally the structure of hydrogen. And that nesting of that dodecahedron is obviously perfected charge collapse. And that became the famous movie Contact and how Jodie Foster effectively entered a lucid dream by that implosion. And what that implosion does in the aura is projects a coherent longitudinal array, your rainbow light body, which is longitudinal plasma coherence into that array of compression. And now that we see that Therify.net as planned <laughs> triggers lucid dreaming. We know how to, how to make the field that creates lucid dreaming. And it's about the implosion, which is obviously the perfected geometry is the Stelle de Deco. And you've all seen this slide before. So if we can accurately visualize what causes a vortex become centripetal and negentropic, the implosive charge collapse, if we can understand for yourself what makes any vortex become implosive? Yeah. Then and put your phones in. Yeah, if you could mute, please. Um, so if mute. yeah, if you could please mute, mute your microphones there, please, please. Thank you. Uh, here we'll mute that one. Um, someone's unmuted. It's it's hard to find the people that are unmuted. But please, okay. So. Um, what ghosts do after death and how tornadoes are steered, all these are plasma physics. It's what makes you centripetal in the plasma tornado that enables you to have that leverage. And remember, all of physics is made of vortex tornadoes. And essentially, you can then understand how alchemy works. So the Achilles heel of zero-point vacuum coherent 
energy devices. In other words, if you understood how implosion works, you could then understand how zero point energy works because the implosive charge cascade to that zero point, that longitudinal node at the still point, when you become fractal and implode that charge, that inertia toward that center is the source of zero point vacuum energy. And there are many examples, the infinity save device from Korea, Bearden's Meg, the Joe cell, I work with most of these people actually, and Keshi as well. But what they don't admit is that almost all these zero point energy devices are in fact unstable. If you park a Joe cell implosive hydrolysis capacitance device over a steel railroad track, it will quit. And uh, also at equinoxes, when the moon becomes because between the sun and the earth, for example. So what we need to understand is that the longitudinal array is the food for the zero point energy device technologies. And until we understand the source of zero point fractal energy, we cannot use zero point energy devices efficiently, effectively. For example, Nikola Tesla, he intended global wireless power, had the frequencies wrong and had the geometry of the longitudinal nodes wrong. And opposite of that was the pyramids of the earth, they did have the nodes correct and the frequency correct. And the original pyramids of the planet, in fact, were a successful, effective global wireless power distribution mechanism. It's clear, we know from our ET sources. And here we wish to acknowledge Charlie Zeese um, uh, at stargatepyramids.com and also his friend, George Leoniak, uh, newgeometry.com, who prepared this presentation that we did recently with Sasha Stone. Notice that uh, he's shown that the Russian pyramids uh, used this um, 76, is it 76 degrees? 76.345 degree base angle, which happens to be the tip angle of the Egyptian pyramids. So the Egyptian pyramids and the, and the Russian pyramids have at that 76 degrees is either the base or the tip. The point is that is the angle that allows a nest of spheres to implode by golden ratio, which is to say enables plasma projection out the vortex tip by golden ratio, which is to say enables zero point charge collapse. Notice that if you look down here, right here, the classic Schauberger vortex imploding and spontaneously getting colder. It has to be piezo rock powder in uh, 50,000 RPM impeller is ideal. And there's other factors. But if that angle of that cone is related to that 76 degrees, it optimizes that implosive charge collapse through the zero point, which is where the Planck array enables longitudinal propagation literally the physics of the gravity wave, that's what enables a charge collapse in the Schauberger piezo water vortex, which spontaneously got colder and generated power from gravity. Here is part of why, is the angle of that cone. Now profoundly, and this was Charlie Zeese's insight here, which I thought was very useful, that same 76 degree angle, which enables golden ratio implosion, is called the angle of spherical refraction in optical physics. This reminds me when John D was studying light scintillation in order to communicate with ghosts, ancestors, and angels, because in the plasma compression at the moment of at literally the production of rainbows, <laughs> that's the implosion to the zero point, And the zero point is the nodes of the longitudinal array, the so-called heaven's grid. And so to impact the longitudinal array with the right centripetal angle of those moments of charge to enable golden ratio implosion is what allowed impedance matching with the longitudinal array, which is how you make phone calls to God. So in fact, the center point of the light cone that allows optimal re refraction, the physics of rainbows, is actually information about communication with ancestors. That's actually the idealized light cone. And so you've all seen this slide before. This is kind of review that most of our electromagnetic energy comes in and out as transverse EMF, a transverse wave, which is up and down, which means that the inertia of that wave is traveling perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Whereas more coherently and therefore more powerfully, on the right, 
the transverse charge comes in from the left, travels down that caduceus, the perfect cone, and the inertia, which was transverse, does translation of vorticity. It makes the L of the phase shift, what makes you an Elohim. <laughs> and out at the tip of that squirt gun, which is the Planck dimension, because the charge arrived at the right symmetric angles and because it was com compressional at that point, we just say longitudinal, out the squirt gun emerges the coherent longitudinal waves where the compression is traveling parallel to the direction of propagation. So remember, all of our electromagnetic communications on this planet use virtually only the transverse portion of the electromagnetic inertia and not the longitudinal. And that's the problem. Sound waves are, are known to be longitudinal. And of course, uh, you know, a tsunami classically is mostly longitudinal when it's in the ocean. It only becomes transverse when it hits the cone of the shore. But it's the compressional or longitudinal wave which carries the inertia at a distance and in fact enables action at a distance, and as Tom Bearden showed, is the physics of gravity waves. So it's important to understand longitudinal EMF, incorrectly called scalar, to understand entering that array. For example, where you go when you lucid dream, where you go when you die, what was called the rainbow light body, what was called the ba from the ka, what Gurdjieff called the Kesjan body. All of that needs an electrical engineer to teach that accurately. So these are the papers we published on this subject. This was first one we should generalize, use the Klein-Gordon generalized wave equations to prove that golden ratio is the wave mechanic solution to constructive wave interference and therefore to constructive compression. So we were the first to prove using generalized wave equations, how and why golden ratio is by equation the solution to compression. So Einstein had agreed the solution to compression was the solution to all his problems. He just didn't know what perfect compression was. A, no one told him what a fractal was, but no one told that, that in 3D, the golden ratio is the solution to fractality. Everyone knew now that fractality is the solution to perfect compression, but no one even knew that golden ratio is the solution to fractality in wave mechanics. So this is what we were talking about, about um, charge collapse. We, you know, this is where we, I'm joking here, we're saying the emperors of physics seem to be wearing no clothes. <laughs> Einstein agreed that infinite non-destructive charge collapse is the solution to gravity and the unified field. Then Wigner and Johnny von Neumann famously said consciousness causes wave function collapse. Later, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff, actually with uh, Gary Schwartz, who lead the largest network of physics of consciousness symposia on the planet, they say consciousness leads to the collapse of the wave function, or they say wave function, collapse of the wave function leads to consciousness. But all of them, if you ask them what causes wave collapse, and therefore what causes consciousness and gravity, is exactly like asking them what causes objects to the fall to the ground. You get a blank stare. <laughs> and so clearly the most important question there, what causes wave collapse is the elephant in the room. <laughs> and, and no one wants to ask. The only really important question is what causes wave collapse. And because no one has a clue, no one even asks the question. Like if you walked into your physics class and said to your physics teacher, you really need to know why an object falls to the ground, he'd probably throw you out because He's so embarrassed that he doesn't have a clue. <laughs> so this is the, I call it the naked elephant in the room. So phase conjugate and fractal charge implosion is the only perfected non-destructive wave collapse and precisely how charge vorticity, conjugate caduceus, translates transverse to longitudinal EMF. And the only physics of gravity waves, the only physics of action at a distance, which is the only physics of almost every single spiritual story you've ever heard is contained in the physics of longitudinal interferometry. It is how consciousness propagates. And in conventional physics, they say action at a distance is quantum entanglement. What they don't know is that phase conjugate embedding perfected is the climax perfection of entanglement. And the articles on this, fractalfield.com slash conjugate perception and conjugate gravity. So 
where we then applied this with uh, Jean-Charles Moyen, we actually made the film with him. He's the famous, famous French secret space program survivor. And he had bilocated with witnesses multiple times. So his lucid dreams became bilocation to the extent that he came back from the beach of bilocation with sand between his toes and a bottle of water. And there were witnesses that he had in fact bilocated. And then later he said, he would see where he was, where he was with one eye and where he was going with the other eye just before that implosion moment. He was literally turning inside out. So he, we measured his ability to do that and we got the brainwave frequency signature, which is here, which is similar to how we measure with iris when the kids are able to see without their eyes. They close their eyes, they see a vortex inside their head and they see through the tube, the vortex, like a wormhole and it becomes an eyeball. They enter bliss and an eyeball forms inside their head while they're blindfolded and they can play Rubik's cubes and do coloring books perfectly every time. And Iris will be presenting that work next time, next week. Well, here we got the same frequency signature in the brain wave, which you can see here, green alpha and uh, purple uh, gamma. The cascade of brain waves from alpha to gamma which was dramatically coherent, was in the case of Jean-Charles Moyen, similar to in geometry. It was the same geometry. It was an alpha to gamma cascade of both golden ratio and octave harmonics, which literally basically is a star mother kit inside your head, by the way. <laughs> but, but in the case of Jean-Charles Moyen, the amplitude of the coherence in his brain waves was off the charts. You know, Patrick had to turn the gain down. So his brainwave made dramatic implosive coherence. And then just at that moment, John Charles will see in one eye where he is and the other eye where he's going. And that actually is literally electrically turning inside out the physics of how a portal and bilocation and stargates work. And illustrating that physics of perfected turning inside out is the famous pinhole camera. So actually, where the light turns inside out at the pinhole, which is the implosion point, is the point where there's a communion with the longitudinal array. And that is the physics of stargates. So please, please, if you could turn your mic off, whoever's making noise, please turn your mic off. Uh, uh, try mute it. Okay. So um, do you see that later when John D was using scintillation and light to communicate with angels and advanced uh, uh, nature spirits, that in fact, the scintillation point that where the light would twinkle effectively was a node for admission into a longitudinal array. And so that principle of turning out then inside out then applies to the physics of the movie Stargate, where in fact, the letters that were used to make the movie, and I work with... Uh, my my boss at that time at Gaia TV was the producer of Stargate, actually. And uh, so the letters they used that are on this Stargate actually are the Ophane and Minokian, which are these hypercube shadows of the plasma donut. You can see that in her work on the physics of angel alphabets, golden mean dot info slash Ophanum. Point is, that was an index to how to turn plasma inside out, the physics of Stargate, much like the five spin inside, seven spin outside, Ophanum sigil of truth here in the center of the Stargate, which is also the physics of the Anu, the perfect slipknot. So essentially, consciousness results when the plasma inside your head implodes. It's a vortex tornado. And that is what you take with you when you lose a dream and when you die. We know exactly what coherence is required to successfully lucid dream and die, the physics of consciousness is not a mystery. And now for the first time, we explain very well exactly what Bill Tiller measured here in dozens of ways that focused human attention causes electric fields to centripetally compress. No one has explained that until our work where we show that the plasma vortex is imploding inside your head. And that's why focused human attention causes electric fields to implode, compress. So this is Wigner and von Neumann's interpretation, consciousness causes wave function collapse. Uh, it's basically the pairs of opposite. So the argument was, uh, 
does the collapse of the wave function lead to consciousness or does consciousness lead to the collapse? And this is the argument underway. And no one seems to have a clue of the cause of that collapse. So this is many articles. Here's an example. This one is Stuart Hameroff talking about, now, about consciousness is the collapse of the wave function. That's our theme for tonight, remember. And he says the media is the microtubule. And as we're going to see, the microtubule is an implosive phase conjugate microwave waveguide. True. But what happens to allow the mitosis, meiosis to happen is the microtubules form a tent that's an octahedron proving that meiosis mitosis is actually phase conjugate optics. So the 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 microtubule is not the consciousness. It's just a media and waveguide for the focus of phase conjugation. And the implosion that results from phase conjugation is actually the nature of consciousness. So these are some of the articles in the physics literature. Um, here, uh, famous Roger Penrose is having this discussion that charge collapse is clearly the mechanism of consciousness. And he describes exactly the principle of equivalence is that the charge collapse, which is the cause of gravity, is identical, he called perfect equivalence, with the charge collapse that's the cause of consciousness. So if you explain, as I'm just doing now, the cause of charge collapse, you have answered the question of the universe, which is the mechanism of consciousness and the mechanism of gravity at the same time. So Dan, this is some serious topic here. Um, so you have mentioned before that microwave conjugation inside the microtubules is actually how you build the double cone of mitosis, which is a phase conjugate phenomena. So it seems like it boils down to the geometrical significance with the structure of uh, microtubules, right? Well, yes, and, and maybe <laughs> since you're asking the right question, we should jump to those slides because they are in this presentation. Um, but that's right. The, micro, the microwave coherence of the microtubule is, is really a very important part of this key. Um, and the microtubule forms a tent during cell division that actually is a phase conjugate array. Yeah, here it is, okay. It's so weird. So there's the microtubule. And this is the microwave study of the microtubule, why it is a microwave guide. It's actually a, an, a helical array. I believe it is 13 uh, around, which makes it piezoelectrically asymmetric with respect to the long axis. But clearly it is a microwave guide, there is no doubt. And, uh, oh, I see, no, I'm sorry, it's nine-sided, which is even more interesting. So now here is that microtubule. Oh, so yes, since we're narrating this slide, uh, in, somebody's, we need to mute somebody here, somebody's, <laughs> whoever's making noise in the background, could you mute, mute please? Uh, Claudio, please mute your microphone, thank you. Uh, Thank you, thank you, yes. Okay, so um, remember, this is the physics of the Star Trek future. That's what we're doing tonight. And in Star Trek, uh, or maybe this myth here should be Star Wars, but they called it microchloridians in the blood that indicated when, the, when you were a Jedi. You were literally plasma projective because of the microwave coherent conjugating imploding plasma projection. Now at Montauk, that was called boson seven in the cellular microwave. It predicted basically who could steer the time chair, who got leverage over the longitudinal array. So this imploding cone is actually an indicator of ensoulment in Boson 7, they were saying, you know, we were going to take the teenagers to steer the time chair at Montauk if they have this certain frequency signature in their DNA. They call it Boson 7. Very similar to microchloridians in the blood. So look, later we're going to show you the slides up here. Well, we have the slides right here, actually. Here is, this is the live blood cell study from uh, Therify.net creating this uh, de rouleau declumping ability of blood cells to stand alone to stand by themselves that we have measured many times in our plasma tech therify quantify and plasma fire them but now here look uh this is a small picture but the somatids are or microzymes are these small plasma coherent emissions when the blood is healthy and by the way i have i'm not this is not propaganda but uh the vax uh, studies done by Laurent and others were very clear, actually, that this disappears when the blood is unhealthy. So clearly, your blood is not spitting out this plasma coherence. 
it says that this is a direct indicator of the metaphor. It's called somatid cycles. And we have a slide on that. Oh yeah, we have that right here. here there's a, That's a somatid cycle. Uh, the morphogenesis of the waveguide uh, in, in cellular metabolism. This is from Galileo, the microscope. Uh, the somatid cycles, which relates to this idea of the microzyme, very famous here in France. And so here, this is the fun slide that Tufan just referred to. Look, this is called the metaphase in biophysics, the meiosis mitosis. And this is the microtubule. And that actually forms the element of a double cone, almost octahedral geometry. Now, when I was studying biophysics at university, you know, I'm raising my hand and saying, well, you know, there's billions of subcellular organelles and they're all choreographing this perfect centripetal dance. And how do they explain that in your biology class? Oh, hell, what is allowing all those billions of molecules to arrange themselves into this incredibly perfect musical dance, double cone octahedron with the lines being microtubules? Hello, that is literally perfect picture of phase conjugation and phase conjugate optics, two light cones imploding. That's what my, makes meiosis and my, mitosis negentropic. That's what holds the whole thing together. There has to be something centripetal in there. Could someone please tell your biology teacher? <laughs> so strong evidence that phase conjugation is the choreographer of meiosis and mitosis. So that's where microtubules are a wave mechanic of consciousness because they're supporting the geometry of phase conjugation in the plasma double light cone. So did I carry on too much, Tufan? What do you think? Uh, that's good. That's a very happy day we're after. <laughs> well, and so this... So this, you know, if, if this is our Star Trek future conversation, this is my good friend at the time, Preston Nichols, designing the Deca Delta antenna, which became the Montauk experiments, right? Which later literally became the movie Contact. And what is this octahedron doing for the microwave? Hello? <laughs> what is a Stargate? So th this is a, this is the background conversation to the real grail, grail conversation. Um, you know, I have just started on this slideshow, but I think maybe maybe Tufan's right. Maybe we should take a few more questions at this point and keep this uh, in a dialogue mode. I don't know. What do you think, Tufan? Sure. Um, uh, there are some questions. Um, first one from um, Shah. She says, hello, I was wondering what is charge collapse? Yeah, what is charge collapse? Well, in other words, um, when scientists say collapse of the wave function, most of them admit that they don't even know what the question means. <laughs> now, it is obvious to me that perfected collapse is identical with perfected compression. What Einstein had in mind is he knew the charge goes somewhere down the throat of the compression between the electrons and the nucleus. The charge has to go somewhere and the charge has to go down that toilet. I mean, that vortex, I mean, that, that light cone. Remember, the electron shells are a platonic nest specifically, meaning golden ratio. Remember, the hadrons of the nucleus, proton, neutron, are a platonic nest specifically. We have the slides here, we'll dig them out later. So the electron shell array, SPDF, is a platonic nest. It's literally our star mother kit. That's literally SPDF subshells. That's what it looks like for sure. And the, the arrangement of the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, guess what? Exactly, exactly a platonic nest. The same platonic nest that Kepler said causes gravity. <laughs> That's charge collapse. So Einstein knew that the charge had to go somewhere down that vortex. And he knew that perfected compression was the answer. Of course, he didn't know what a fractal was. But once you understand that the center node of that array, which is the Planck threshold, is where you get contact with the global, even galactic longitudinal array. So if you want to exchange inertia efficiently with this whole superluminal nodal array, you have to get it lined up down the throat of this vortex. That is what perfected collapse is. It's the collapse of the wave function in the sense that we know that 
the inertia of a wave of charge can ultimately never be destroyed. A wave never dies. It's literally immortal. And Einstein knew that much. So he knew when that wave of charge carries its inertia down to the center of the atom, it had to go somewhere. Oh, where does it go? Uh, they don't know. But we now know. We knew the day that Tom Bearden proved by equation that longitudinal interferometry, coherent longitudinal EMF waves, is the physics of gravity waves. And by the way, the same longitudinal waves, he called it gravitobiology, is how you make a plant grow. <laughs> Centripetal, huh? And so now we know exactly where that wave of charge goes when it reaches the bottom of the toilet. I mean, the bottom of the vortex. It goes into a longitudinal array. That is non-destructive charge collapse. That is the collapse of the wave function. And the centripetal electrical suction that that creates is the charge acceleration named the gravity and the cause of life force and the cause of consciousness inside your head. Remember, the kids are seeing a plasma vortex form inside their head and they say, I can now see through it like an eyeball even if I'm blindfolded, and we know exactly how you take that with you when you lucid dream during near-death experience and when you die. We do know what the physics of consciousness is, for sure. It is that plasma vortex specifically caused by implosive charge collapse. So thank you for asking the right question. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dan. There is another one from Kat. She asks, what happens if you don't die? What happens if you don't successfully die? <laughs> yeah, well, you see, people say that a soul cannot be destroyed. I say that most wave mechanics that we have in our memory, because it is not uh, a does not store a pure principle of survival memory for the species, in effect, is not useful to the collective unconscious. So. We are served at the moment of death by forgetfulness because we need for, to forget most of that crap. What you have focused on that is pure principle and that is of survival value to all of DNA, that will never die. And that perfect distribution of charge is what can enter the compression that allows you to enter the nodal array called hey, ave, heaven, or plains of Sharon, or Champs-Élysées, literally the physics of bliss. So when you die, the preparation is to prepare for compression, exactly the preparation for bliss and birth and death and lucid dreaming. It is that you're, you've distilled the memory of every day into what is pure principle. Everything else <laughs> is... It doesn't make it through compression, and that's good. That's why successful death is a black hole experience. That's why surgeons have proven that death visions are electrically contagious, because if you want to enter that array, you do need to survive compression, and that is a very useful test. It's called Secret Places of the Lion. The, the lion serves you by smelling for fear, because that will not do compression well. <laughs> So essentially, death is not something to be feared, but it is something to be prepared for. And one of the best ways to prepare is to plan to learn how to lucid dream, which in which you literally enter that same coherent longitudinal array, the physics of heaven. And that's why all that hygiene about where the magnetic line crosses are matters, because that's how you get in and out. For example, sunrise and sunset are very helpful. You know, equinox is very helpful because these allow you to enter the phase conjugate four-wave mixing to embed in that array. That's why the same physics of a magnetic line cross or a sunrise or sunset serves therify, labyrinth, cathedrals, bliss, birth, death. That ability to enter that array is part of that physics. Next question. Um, next one comes from Daniel. He says... So if the charge collapse is the non-destructive self-re-entry turning inside out of the yes. toroidal donut, <laughs> Thank you. enabled by five-fractal reiteration, and the more harmonic inclusive the foci is, the more charge and spin accelerates, then my question is, 
is an aura field that has not been tuned to phi, still always spinning, turning inside out, but canceling out its own asymmetric waves as it does so, according to harmonic inclusive, it is determined, de determined by phi. Wow, thank you for using all our favorite words in one sentence. That was so cool. <laughs> no, but it's really a useful thought. So what we're essentially saying is that, for example, if you're living in a cabin in the woods and you're immersed in Schumann harmonics, then your aura is going to get bigger and bigger and you're going to be well distributed. You'll do great for lucid dreaming and dying well. And that's why, you know, living 3,000 years on the same magnetic line and the aboriginals can steer that magnetic line. On the other hand, if you lived in a steel and aluminum building with huge electrosmog and, uh, and, you know, in bad air and bad magnetics in the big city for, you know, it, it will fractionate that aura and will fail to embed and eventually lucid dreaming will be weakened and children will have less ability to have a soul. And that is Enki's key lesson. That is right. And you're right. So harmonic inclusiveness is a measure of how many, how many axes of spin can remain superposed in your aura. And that's why harmonic inclusiveness is the best way for a doctor to measure how much immune system you have. That's called heart rate variability. And harmonic inclusiveness is perfected by fractality. And that's well known in the medical literature. What's not known is that harmonic fractality is literally perfected by golden ratio tuned to Planck. That's the new information that we've contributed here. But yes, that then inspires a whole series of lessons about hygiene, about how to have a soul. Exactly. Okay, next one comes from Hana. She asks if there's anything in creation that does not follow this pattern that you are describing. She says she cannot think of anything and not see this pattern as soon as she heard it. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of our hypothesis would be not only is the medical literature correct that harmonic inclusiveness predicts how long you are going to live, and that's conventional medical wisdom today, but harmonic inclusiveness, optimized by golden ratio, predicts how long anything is going to live atoms, babies, planets, galaxies, universes, <laughs> because it is a predictor of charge distribution success, which is another way of saying get fractal or get dead. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Tessa asks, if I remember correctly in your YouTube videos, you talk about communicating with the Anunnaki, I guess. Is there a way to contact them as well to learn even more? Uh, did they help teach you this information? You know, I think questions are more fun than presentations. This is great. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there is an upcoming lecture, uh, which is our ET history. You know that our ET history, which I've been working on for 30 years, fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood. It's all there. But the short answer would be, I happen to, after you know, writing a book on Enki after my Kundalini, just the way Anton Parks did in Sitchin. Did. They all wrote a book about Enki just after a Kundalini. Interesting, huh? <laughs> it's like the three Christs of Ypsilanti. Everybody believes. <laughs> but so the Anand, I think Elena Danan got it right. And that's why I've done so many lectures with her on her channel, that the Anunnaki at that time were a cross between basically the humanoids and the greys. And that... Uh, the conflict in that family, the Enki and Lil, became a big part of the history of Earth. And I believe, for example, that when Graham Hancock is running around saying there was an ancient culture in the Ice Ages, that Enki is the answer to every ancient culture he goes to look after. Veracoca, Quetzalcoatl, it's all Enki. You know, it's like all done with mirrors. <laughs> and, and so that basically then the conflict in that family was directly the Lemurian Atlantean battle and the uh catastrophe the great flood of the lesser dryad at the end of the ice age was actually the galactic federation booting what elena denon calls the calls the nabu which is mostly grays in the dracos out of our solar system which they did recently but they will be back and we need to get ready uh so it, it, contacting the anunnaki would not be really the goal even in my in my view no no uh most of the what we call the anunnaki history we now know is uh, summarized by the fact that 
Enlil turned this planet into a slave colony and getting him booted out of here was the biggest accomplishment of the last few thousand years, thanks to the Galactic Federation. And not thanks to us, actually. Uh, and, and Anki, Hermes, and their team, I think, has returned. I think Elena Danan is right. That's the Super Galactic Federation called the Nine. And that's a whole other story. Started with Andrew Poharik and became the Star Trek, the Star Wars series. Actually, it was, was the story of the Nine, which is plasma physics. And this is a very advanced culture and civilization. And this is very appropriate to communicate with. But the first step of communicating with very advanced plasma beings is intense bliss experience, actually. And so when my friend, um, John McGovern from Adelaide, he had discovered that a little plasma shadow physics, and he could read every shaman carving in every ancient cave on the planet. And then the only place he published that work was Los Alamos Plasma Physics laboratory. That's the only place they publish that work with Tony Peratt, who discovered that all ancient shaman languages is actually plasma physics. Ain't that cool? <laughs> so were they communicating? Oh, yeah. Did they know a language? Oh, yeah. Was it the shadows of plasma? Oh, yeah. How do you make phone calls? <laughs> so to be continued in the upcoming lecture on galactic history coming at fractalu.com. Meantime, check out uh, fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood. But the short answer really is, you know, channeling is dangerous astral hygiene in general. And part of what we are going to discuss in the lecture on galactic history in the upcoming FractalU.com will be my personal experience with Andre Puharik, who first communicated with Atun, Anki Tom, he called him. And there were dramatic astral hygiene problems at that time because Bentoff, my teacher, and Puharik, they were at the opposite sides of the Israeli war. And Puharik started making phone calls to the Anunnaki the days after he learned how to replace the ears of deaf people by using a piezoelectric oscillator capacity coupling the bone and ringing the bone in the head, which is the physics of clairaudience. This is what Andre Park's MD was so famous for, his, uh, his devices to enable deaf people to hear. And then shortly after that, he began getting phone calls from Enki. Is that a coincidence? What is the lesson in astral hygiene? So we're going to be discussing that in some details in our upcoming lecture. Next question. Arshda asks, is one's light body, the Merkaba, a way to enter the Planck threshold? We have that article, goldenmean.info slash Merkaba, M-E-R-K-A-B-B-A-H, in which we discussed, you know, I, I worked for 20 years with Drin Velo's Flower of Life group in that regard. Clearly, what's called the Merkaba largely is this useful exercise of visualizing spinning, 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 counter-rotating star tetra around the body, which is essentially a cube. It's at the center of the star mother kit. And visualizing a cube around your body is a great start at cohering your aura. Absolutely. Tetra cube, all octave ratios, is a perfect way to crystallize. It's why nature uses hex snowflakes, because it's very stable. <laughs> Problem is... In a tetra cube, you get no golden ratio, no implosion, and no center point. Oops. <laughs> so Drunvalo correctly taught, well, there is a climax step, but it's dangerous, so we're not going to tell you. Well, actually, if you don't finish the tetra cube visualization without going from hex to pent, there are all kinds of astral hygiene problems. Short, simple reason is, and it's all at that article, goldenmean.info slash Merkaba, and we personally saw these astral hygiene problems all over the flower of life people was that if you don't finish, the finish is the angle this cube is at in this pent dodeca. There's a cube here. Can you see the cube? Well, maybe, but get the star mother kit. <laughs> but the angle that cube is at in that dodeca is a 32 degree tilt. So you tilt the cube up 32 degrees, rotate, blink five times, then you have pent dodeca, this. And the hex goes to pent. 
Now, Drinvalo correctly taught that, oops, that could be dangerous because you might get dizzy. And you will get dizzy if you're not ready for perfect charge collapse. How do you get ready for perfect charge collapse? Oh, that's the same ready way you get ready for bliss or death. <laughs> You sort your memories to those which become shareable, pure principle, and are ready for implosion non-destructively. Any anger and you're toast, man. <laughs> so yes, you know, don't do that last step unless you're ready. But oops, if you never do the last step, oops. <laughs> so specifically, the answer to this questioner is that the charge collapse that takes you to that longitudinal still point is never possible in the pure tetracubic classic Merkaba. And it's always possible only after the hex becomes pent, which is the first time you get golden ratio in any centering force. The thing is there is a psychological work to do to get ready to, to do that because that's when your aura gets sorted. And you see, once it turns pent and it starts imploding, that fire will toast all parasites because every wave that's not shareable at the center of implosion gets toasted. That's why if you have bliss, you'll have no problem with any stomach parasites or astral parasites. Okay. Dan asks, he saw something on the horizon in the toroidal field linked to consciousness. Wondering if you have any thoughts on this? Among many others, thanks for your time. <laughs> Well, for some reason, I'm remembering that a couple days in a row, Valerie and I saw the green flash at sunset on the horizon in Australia. I think it was Perth. And we learned later the physics of the reason a green flash occurs is the same reason yeah. you have rainbows when Tibetan saints die, that the centripetal force of a saint creates coherence in the atmosphere. Someone mute their mic, please. <laughs> I don't know if you can see whose mic, mic is not muted there. Oh, here, let's try muting that one. Okay. Um, All muted now. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> good, good. Work on. So, no, I, I mean, it, theoretically, everything you see on the horizon is toroidal. I, I, theoretically, you're never going to see anything which is toroidal. In physics, the way they talk about that is everything is made of a vortex wormhole string theory, and the vortex wormhole are connected by donuts at a distance. It's all, it's all tornadoes. Conventional physics is clear. There's nothing in physics but tornadoes. That's clear. But specifically, the atmospheric visions on the horizon uh, if you study the physics of what enables rainbows to occur, it's the electrical coherence of the atmosphere. So there is literally a certain magic of the moment when you can have a green flash, which is the climax form of rainbow formation. That's why the famous mathematician book, which is sacred to the Sufis called Mount Analog by René Dumas. And you could not enter the kingdom of heaven without, you could never even begin to climb the mountain to bliss unless you did it by the light of the green flash. Think about what that means. It means if your city is full of pollution, <laughs> you're not going to get a green flash because the atmosphere has to phase conjugate. That's why there's really a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Anyway, <laughs> that was poetry. Thank you. Andonai asks, can you explain how a magnet works? <laughs> you know, I don't think even conventional physics can explain why a magnet works. But I, you line up the dipole in a permissive material, there's permissive and permittive, that allows magnetic lines to travel. And if they, the conventional answer is that the molecules in the magnetic dipole are lined up and you cohere them. So actually they form a magnet by put, taking permissive material and putting that as it goes from a liquid to a crystal, as it cools, they put that in a very strong magnetic field to line up the magnetic dipole molecules in the forming magnet. Uh, um, the classic ones we use for the uh, the imploder.com, for example. And that li lining up the magnetic dipoles in the magnet allow the magnetic lines to uh, become coherent end to end. Now, the thing that's interesting is that when we say, is it electrical or is it magnetic? Uh, 
actually on the surface of the torus, which is the shape of all magnetic fields, the portion of the flux that's going up and down, you can think of that as electrical, and the portion of the flux which is going perpendicular to that on the same torus, and it's the same flux, is called magnetic. So the difference between electro and magnetic is only whether you're referring to the amount of flux which is going this way on the torus versus what's going perpendicular to that. Electro, magnet. that's why when these new age woo-woo say, well, that was electric and this over here is magnetic and that's separate, that is pure schizophrenia <laughs> because actually it's all simply the flux on a torus and the part of that flux that's going perpendicular on the same donut, we call that magnetic, and the other part we call electric, but it's actually the same flux on the same donut. That's why they're coupled, and that's how magnetic induction works, and that's how motors work, and that's that's a lovely long story that's the beginning of an electrical engineering curriculum. But ultimately then, to understand how when those magnetic lines converge, if they implode, you can make healing and gravity. And when those electrostatic lines converge and implode, you can make healing and gravity. Why? Because it's all the same flux. So you have phase conjugate magnetics, we have phase conjugate electrostatics, you have phase conjugate optics. It's implosion is really what it's about. And whether you call it light or electric or magnetic, it's just referring to different geometries of the same flux. All right, we have around 10 more questions. This one is from Mike Jung. I am a knob, by the way, but I find this incredibly interesting. How does telepathy and synchronicity fit into all this? These questions are so good. You guys are, you guys are fun, you know what? <laughs> uh, no, so we think the physics of telepathy. Let me give an example of electrical engineering discussing the physics of telepathy. You have the famous uh, Kozirev from Russia and our good friend, uh, Professor Karatkov went around with Kozirev and proved their measurements of telepathy. So what they did, they took what they called a Kozirev mirror, which is really a metal cylinder, but the diameter of that cylinder was a very coherent microwave. And now we know how to optimize those cylinder diameters because we can use my equation. We can make that microwave phase conjugate and mindful. <laughs> but anyway, they took these metal cylinders and they would go around and stick them in certain places. Later, they learned that if you wanted to get military quality telepathy with cozy rev mirrors, you needed to measure whether you had a magnetic line cross of the earth of sufficient flux density, and they specified that in nano Teslas. They were very specific about that. If you if the earth magnetic line wasn't crossing there, then your cozy rev mirror would not make telepathy. No. But if you did place that, mag that metal cylinder, which is projecting conjugate microwave mindfulness, <laughs> add a magnetic line cross, then every single time you got military quality telepathy around the world. This is called cozy rev mirror work. And, you know, Karatko spent half his life. We know him well. It's a, it's a fun story. So what did we learn about the physics of telepathy? Hello. <laughs> It was microwave embedding in the longitudinal array. The same earth grid magnetic line crosses that produce conjugate four-wave mixing embedding in a longitudinal nodal array called the sacred dodeci cosa earth grid, anti-gravity in their earth grid. It's, it's the star mother kit, except it's the earth grid. So that longitudinal coherent nodal array is the physics of telepathy and global wireless power for a very specific reason. It is charge distribution perfected. Those nodes of compression are a, a, a longitudinal nodal array where the longitudinal waves bounce and exchange inertia from transverse to longitudinal and back. That's why you can use longitudinal array to contain heat at a distance if you knew longitudinal microwave interferometry. That is the holy grail of all fusion research. It's the physics of all action at a distance. So once you understand how these nodes of compression work, you know, for example, why they called it song line dreaming track. <laughs> so that's also why the more bliss you have, the more your longitudinal DNA radio works. The more bliss you have, the more you can feel those magnetic lines. You become a dowser 
by definition, once you start to have bliss process. And that's you doing DNA radio with the earth. And that's the physics of all telepathy, for example. And you could actually have that same conversation about the physics of clairaudience and clairvoyance. Actually, my clairaudience became quite dramatic after 30 years of Kundalini. Uh, and we can tell stories about that as well. So again, once we understand a little bit more about that longitudinal coherence nodal array being fractal, it's much easier to understand the physics of telepathy, why relaxation, trance, and bliss enable telepathy, and exactly where that DNA radio is more available. For example, when Karatkov followed the Kogi to where they made phone calls to ancestors, he determined by measurement that air was more fractal. And then we agreed, him and I, we discussed at length and that we measure the same thing, fractality in the air, the physics of telepathy, with our life force measuring technology, flameandmind.com slash life force, the same way we measure which building will cause a seed or a child to grow to determine which architects should get a paycheck, bioarchitects.net. Thank you. Curtis Kennedy asks, what's the gentleman's name who used bone conduction to restore hearing in individuals? Yeah, um, this was Andrea Puharik, famous A-N-D-R-I-J-A-H, Andrea Puharik, P-U-H-A-R-I-C-H, Dr. Andrea, who, uh, it, it is only planted of choice, the book about the return of Anki uh, is, essentially starts with Andrea Puharik, and his work with Phyllis Schlemmer is how Roddenberry learned to write Star Trek, Star Wars, actually, we believe, and uh, Andrea, I knew Andrea because he and I were both very active on the U.S. Psychotronics lecture, lecture circuit. We lectured together on many stages. His wife was a piano player. And the um, the uh, story uh, the story of the death of Andrea Puhark is part of the slideshow that we didn't finish tonight. But it, it, what, it was bone conduction. But I, I warn you, there is a frequency signature to enable the heterodynes to conjugate which is part of the clue of when the bone conduction becomes actually hearing without ears and the physics of clairaudience. And Andrea didn't understand all of that, but he got far enough that he began to be effectively an electrical channeler. And that's the beginning of his phone calls to Enki. Bernd Eckhart says, hello, Daniel. Can you explain the physics behind monoatomic elements? Damn winter for presidency. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think Trump would like me. I don't know about Biden, but well, I say that the definition of poly politics is the body polis. <laughs> this is my political announcement. So when a beehive has enough coherence in their collective plasma, which is literally collective bliss, that's called a body polis. And at that point, a beehive can swarm because the coherence of their collective aura is navigable. And the royal, the royal blood is obviously the navigator, the lucid dreamer, the royal or the queen. And so the definition of a political body is biologically clear. <laughs> if you do not have collective bliss, your collective plasma is not navigable. You ain't going to make it through the heart of the sun. And any other definition of politics other than the biology of bliss is actually counter serving survival. <laughs> there, that was my political announcement. <laughs> Are you serving bliss process? Then you're political. Otherwise, no. And you would have to then know what the biology of bliss is, which is charge radiance. Hello, is that a new definition of politics? I think it's fun. <laughs> Thank you for nominating me. Okay. <laughs> so what was, oh, the question was <laughs> Ormi's gold powder. Yes. Well, let's take the example. The uh, Anunnaki were such klutzes, they could not get through the Van Allen belts without nuking their way through. They needed then a device in which to stick them nukes called the Ark of the Covenant, designed by the Syrians. And gold and the acacia wood dielectric is implosive capacitance. And we know why implosive capacitance reduces radioactivity measurably. I was with Keshe, basically. And in the Bible, this was called the Plague of Azoth. And the Azoth is both the, the, the nitrogen poisoning, which is the French word for nitrogen, which the Dracos breathe, basically. But also, that was the word for radiation poisoning, hint, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the spark gap on the Ark of the Covenant was 
a gold square wave implosive capacitance, which could stabilize gold in its monoatomic state. Holy communion, mana, or means the spice. Now, the reason a gold atom will not be stable in a monoatom state unless it has a supporting electric field is because it's pure implosion, man. <laughs> So the gold powder that David Hudson made would, was actually very dangerous to your aura because it would melt a hole in it. Actually, we had some, oh my God. <laughs> but agricultural ormies, which is where they derive it from deep sea water and the trace mineral there, amulets, the ormies, the gold powder, uh, and they do it by that strong alkaline, and the milky. Agricultural ormies is famous. We proved it in bloomthedesert.com. So the, the gold atom in its monoatomic state is a simple symmetry example of pure implosion at the atomic level, which can be powerful and immortal and dangerous. And the history of alchemy is replete with examples of people killing themselves because they didn't understand. Starting with uh, the mad caliph, when he sold about 60% of the volume of what became the Kaaba stone, and he got mad because he was eating the stuff. <laughs> and the 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 Kaaba stone was a glass meteorite, which had uh, Lucifer's eye, which had vaporized gold in nanobubbles, which made it an implosive dielectric. It was the perfect dielectric. It was implosion. Uh, capacitively, it was the most one of the most implosive substances possible, super dielectric, let's call it. So a little bit of that powder is how Flamel and John D made the purest gold ever measured by the British Royal Society. And that is an example of non-destructive charge collapse, the only actual physics of alchemy. And we'll do another session on this. We might do some alchemy stories, but that story is pretty well described in my work with uh, Vincent Bridges, who remembered his life as Kelly, who made the purest gold ever measured. Uh, by the British Royal Society at fractalfield.com slash alchemy of fusion. And there's that whole story. So the history of alchemy and the history of gold powder is related beautifully to the physics of non-destructive charge collapse. And it's true. If you had a heart of gold, <laughs> you would have that immortality. So next question. <laughs> this one is from Dr. Shelley Evans. Hi, Shelley. Hi, Shelley. Um, she says, Patrick Flanagan for Curtis question. With so much focus on Anki, shouldn't we include Samueta, female counterpart of Sam? Ah, Anki's lady. <laughs> oh, also, Simon. as it applies to maybe the magnetism question, same, same. Ah, nice. Thank you, Shelley. Well, you know, um, Anton Parks, who I think had the best biography of Enki going, really, much better than Sitchin. And I wrote a book on Enki, and actually goldenmean.info slash Enki. And I think Anton Parks has got more history detail, clearly. <laughs> and he has a lot to say <laughs> about Enki's lady, uh, which relates the story of Isis and Enki's mother also. Uh, but the short story was that after Enki was effectively... Uh, you know, his his aura was taken apart. This is the myth. And that she reassembled his aura into the orbit of Venus, actually, which is pent, which was Enki's wife's way of immortalizing because planetary orbitals can be the matrix of incarnation of very advanced stellar beings, which relates to Enki Osiris not just inhabiting the orbit of Venus, which was a morning star, which relates that story, but actually inhabiting the sun, which we know is true of Osiris. So I would say there's a beautiful uh, thoughts on your beautiful question on the power of uh, Enki's uh, wife. Uh, Valerie, do you remember the title of that book about um, Isis goddess? What is mother of Enki? What the re that uh, Anton Park's second wife wrote? Oh, there's a whole beautiful series on, on the power of the ladies behind Enki. So I'm not good enough in that history to really... Do, do you remember the title of that book? No? Oh. <laughs> but there's a whole series on the power of Enki's ladies. And that should be another conversation. And you're right, we should have it. I'm just not prepared to have the conversation right now. <laughs> Sorry. Susan asks, can you speak to Hepta, seven-pointed evolution? Yeah. Well, 
you know, we believe the reason uh, the Ophana Minokian sigil of truth had seven points on the outside and five on the inside, um, and why the seven circuit Cretan Minoan labyrinth, uh, these are all uh, description of the physics of the fact that a tetra cube has seven arrows, seven axes of symmetry, and that's called sevenarrows.net, and where we have this whole description. So clearly, um, the history of tetracubic symmetries, which are the reason the human heart muscle layers, seven of them are exactly at the symmetry tilt angles of the seven arrows of the tetra, which is also the exact physics of the origin of Hebrew and Sanskrit and uh, many other things. And why, when the clairvoyants looked at the heart of the sun and the heart of the human and the heart of the hydrogen, they saw the exact same yeah. omni and the slideshow slideshow is here on that and they saw seven spins outside five <laughs> oh could you mute there do we have somebody who's not muted Hi, anyway? what's going on are you are you upstairs oh. can you find out who's not muted there uh, uh beate can you somebody please, brought a, your a metal beate would you mute? cute you know rococo bed frame with a mattress beate, down oh, the stairs oh. at the public then are you access. able to mute everyone set up there? a photo shoot in the oh, sunset with, the with this like bathing suited woman or something in the bed it was so funny and i tried to take pictures. malibu california yeah okay i got her muted all right that, that was rude really rude you're right I, for the next time i have to learn how to mute her i'm not that good at using skype yet sorry guys uh, uh, but so just to finish the thought so um uh this the hepta uh geometry is inherently tetra tetracubic and that is not evil. It's useful and powerful because it's the shadow of the symmetry that starts phase conjugation. All phase conjugation began with lasers in a cube. That's how it started because tetracube symmetries produce octave geometries, which is perfect for stabilizing. So hepta, everything about hepta symmetries means crystallizing, stabilizing. Why? Ice is hex. It's perfect for stabilizing. It's useless for imploding, but it's the necessary first step because until you stabilize the tetracubic lattice, you can't get the more subtle pent lattice stabilized in its center. In other words, you can't make a dodeca form until you get your cube stable first. And that's what the hep the sevenfold symmetry is. And that those animations is all beautiful at sevenarrows.net. Okay, um, Songman asks, where did the wave come from in the first place? <laughs> yeah, uh, we, you know, phys physics doesn't know where the Big Bang came from. But what physics is clear, there is nothing but waves. That is absolutely clear in physics. And anybody who dreams there's such a thing as a particle is basically a dummy. <laughs> Particles are only a name for a slipknot of waves. That's all they are. And because when waves form slipknot, the Anu, for example, they store some inertia, and we call that inertia mass. So charge is a superfluid, definitely. Nassim and I agree on this. Charge is a flowing superfluid, and charge is everything in the universe. Plus and minus charge is actually compression and rarefaction, and that is everything that exists. And that superfluid propagates, obviously, as a wave. And so the only thing that actually exists in the universe is waves in that superfluid. And those waves will all cancel out unless they agree. Now, it is extremely profound that the Planck dimension is the same for a million light years in all directions. Why is the Planck dimension the same? Hello? That is a wonderful example of the fact that waves that don't agree get dead. <laughs> it's very simple. <laughs> and the Planck geometry that Planck array, hydrogen being dodecafractal, for example, and the, the mass arrangement of the masses in the universe is dodeca, the earth grid is dodeca, and DNA is dodeca, and hydrogen is dodeca. What does that tell you? <laughs> that waves are going to die unless. So we don't know what caused the first wave. What we do know is the universe is a superfluid of charge, and waves in that superfluid is everything that exists. 
Malena asks, hi Dan, can you say something about the psychic gift of magnetism? I have heard of this recently, but wonder what it is and how it can be explained in physics. I, I'm guessing that that question refers to, for example, in Fran France, someone who does healing with their hands is called a magnetizer often. I'm guessing that relates to the question. Um, and it's true that some people actually have literally magnetic hands, but uh, more than symbolically, magnetizers uh, is, is one way of describing the ability to heal with your hands, for example. And the fact is that the ability to steer lines of charge with your attention, which is how you become a magnetizer and ultimately even make a magnetic field with your hands. So the fact that ultimately you can have a conscious control of a magnetic line with your attention is one of the most profound examples of the physics of consciousness that exists. In other words, look, we were told in the Gurdjieff school, you will not begin to learn sacred gymnastics, which is how to make an immortal body, until you can make feeling in your baby finger. And I've told this story many times. What they call feeling in the baby finger was the fact that if you can put your attention into your baby finger with enough electrical force to cause it to begin to tingle, that was the day you're ready to start to learn the bliss dance. Until then, you ain't ready to start. Why? Because not only are you steering your blood with your attention, and as your attention becomes more coherent, you can steer a tornado with that same electric field. So you're damn right you better learn how to put, make your little, the tip of your little finger burn with your attention, or you ain't going to get very far. <laughs> you're getting leverage over the lines of force of the field because your attention is your ability to steer that tornado. Your attention is nothing else than your ability to steer an electric tornado and eventually to steer the sun. You, yes, start with your baby finger, absolutely. And then you're a magnetizer. And yes, there are people that can pick up nails with the magnetic field of their hand. It's real. <laughs> Michelle asks, how or from whom is the best way to learn how to lucid dream? Ah, learning how to lucid dream, I think is probably one of the most important questions that any of us is going to study in our lifetime honestly, because it is so clear that lucid dreamers predict who is taking memory through death. Think about that for a moment. What does that mean? It is, it's the storal to the mori, man. There ain't nothing, basically nothing else is important by comparison. You know, immortality, well, yeah, that's important. Hello. So yes, we absolutely must learn the physics and the the hygiene of lucid dreaming. So thank you for asking the right question. Now, I'm a little bit, uh, let's say I have very little humility. I'm very proud of the fact that Therify.net replicably helps people lucid dream. And we know exactly why, because Therify, that plasma implosion compresses and helps a longitudinal array to propagate coherently around your body when it's in that plasma field of compression. So it helps your body to propagate coherent longitudinal electromagnetics, which is the stuff of lucid dreaming. Now, if you did that on magnetic line cross, you know, and also a little easier at sunrise and sunset and a little easier at equinox, et cetera, because these are all four wave mixing, the physics of conjugation. But now there are a beautiful library on the yoga of lucid dreaming. I mean, lucid dreaming is well studied. It turns out, and we didn't have time for the whole slideshow, but I have a slide of the recently published neurology literature on the frequencies that cause lucid dreaming. Hello, I'm proud to say it fit my equation. It's so cool. So implosion helps create lucid dreaming because it helps your aura to be coherent. And that's exactly the physics of what the Egyptians meant by Ba from the Ka, Gurdjieff meant by Kesjan body, Tibetans meant by rainbow light body, or was meant by the Vril, or was meant by the El as an Elohim. These are all names for ability to plasma project coherently in the longitudinal. And that's exactly precisely what's meant by the raising of the Jed. Exactly. That's what a Jedi is. 
Now, the psychology of that is a lifetime study, obviously. It means your aura needs to be kept coherent. It means you need to be thinking of a shareable wave. And ultimately, it also means that you, you become part of the wind of ancestor memory. So for example, the more become, you become aware of the yearning at the moment of death of your most important ancestors, that will be the wind in the sail of your lucid dreaming. Because that wind in that longitudinal array is what the aboriginals call dreaming track. So that's a beautiful science. And there's beautiful literature on lucid dreaming. For example, Nine Faces of Christ, when he discovers, first time he, he went to his lover in his dream, he could see his lover, but he couldn't hear her. And then he wanted to smell. And each time he lucid dreamed to his lover, he took with him another organ of perception. What does that tell you? The growth of coherence in a light body? So the study of lucid dreaming is exquisitely important. It's, it's the issue. And the more you recognize the importance of the energy array, the magnetic lines of the earth, the ley lines, the cross points, the more you can embed yourself in that body. Why the ancestors who walk barefoot on the same magnetic lines for a thousand years, they're the ones that could lucid dream. They're the ones that had a soul. And they're the ones, the Dracos and the Gray, the Nebu came here to steal their DNA. Why? <laughs> That's the gold of the galaxy, that kind of DNA. So yeah, we better study it because that's, that's our value in galactic politics, you know, our technology, no, but our lucid dreaming skills, yes, that's the value. Thank you, Dan. So how are we doing with time? We have uh, several more questions. Do you want to take the last question and finish or would you like to continue? Well, let, let's go on for a few. My, my voice sure. is getting a little tired, but let's do a few more because it's fine. All right. Yeah. How does the theta brain wave connect with bliss? The gamma wave of 40 hertz has helped me collapse the wave, but I don't know, but I don't understand why yet. A very important question, very useful question. A lot on that at flameandmind.com. Short summary. Originally, as Valerie says, the, the ability to make 40, for actually 44 hertz uh, gamma frequencies was named Tibetan gamma, <laughs> the Tumo. They were famous for it. And actually, I think one of the reasons why I am a lousy lucid dreamer, sorry, if you can't do it, teach it. Oh, no, I'm not good at it. And I think one of the reasons that I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, but it's, is I'm not very good at making gamma. I can make five harmonics in golden ratio, a, a delta, alpha, theta, I can make five harmonics in golden ratio, have an intense bliss experience. But climbing that ladder to the high frequency gamma, you know, it's a challenge for me. And yet Patrick, who measured the kids who can see without their eyes, and when uh, Jean-Charles Moyen's lucid dream became a stargate, he said, it's a ladder from alpha, around eight hertz, up to gamma. And that ladder has octave and golden ratio harmonics. And when you get that ladder together, <laughs> stargates, portals, you know, lucid dreams. Oh, yeah. So effectively, it is, it is where the leverage on the grid maximizes. So, for example, because I can make dramatic coherence, low frequency delta, I can make delta harmonics out. That means I have access to the collective unconscious, actually. It means, yeah, I do. I, Valerie asked me after somebody's death and where their memory is, and somehow I get intuitions. I can I can talk to DNA radios, and I'm a little bit clair, clair audience. So I have certain skills, you know, and they're Kundalini related. But gamma, I'm not quite there yet. And I know what that means, actually. And you see the theta is the, uh, the you know, the around the 20 hertz is um, the active thinking brain. And when that gets into resonance with the alpha, which is around the eight hertz, and I can make that cascade beautifully. And I can have, you know, tingling haired bliss experiences at will because I can do that after so much Kundalini. But climbing the ladder to gamma, <laughs> what the Tibetans did, I didn't quite make it there. And that is where you get access to that, that higher leverage. And what that does is that completes 
that tornado to really high leverage char charge collapse. So yes, when you can complete the cascade from alpha to gamma, then you get some serious power. And gamma training is part of flameandmind.com newly, thanks to Patrick. It's beautiful work and brainwave teaching. So Guili says the earth has a mission for you, then it's not letting you reach gamma. So you can stay here <laughs> a bit longer and not hang with Anki all day in the plains of Sharon. Yeah, 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 it's true. You know, we went to this property one time and there was a perfect magnetic vortex and I could feel my attention go way up in the sky and I knew I could have gone out of my body, no problem. But I was a little dizzy after that job. <laughs> so it's true. If you go too far away in your bliss, it's a little hard to come back. <laughs> so how does the electric universe theory fit in with everything you mentioned? No, electric universe theory is wonderful. It's very useful. They're totally aware the universe is 99.999% plasma. And most of those guys know that the beautiful plasma is angels up there. They know it. <laughs> I think the plasma universe, electric universe people are on a very useful track. That's my opinion, actually. And once they begin to see that these are intelligent plasma beings, and a lot of them know that these huge, gorgeous plasma geometries that are interstellar in skies, they know that they're mindful. Ooh, great people. Daniel Zuluaga says, my question is, so if the body is functionally equivalent to a radio receiver transmitter for information flow, we call our stream of consciousness, then my question is, how do we dial our body's natural crystal os oscillators to the frequency signatures of a specific node in that array for communication with that node. Say, if we want, if I wanted to clairaudiently sign you a line of a song in a self-induced state of bliss and have you pick it up through the piezoelectric phonon compressions in your skull brain. Blessings then. Thank you infinitely for this all. Uh, that's a pretty detailed question there. Well, I, I know that uh, Bill, Elizabeth, was very clear that when you set up a Stargate portal, you've got this complex array and you need the perfect, exact, broad spectral frequency signature of the send point and receive point. They have to be perfectly matched. I mean, impedance matched. So there's a lot behind that question. I mean, the short answer to such questions really is nature. I mean, yes, you know, if you had the right magic temple or sacred space it would help but the best temple is always really nature itself like luke skywalker going deep underground to raise the jet you know so nature is really the the, the ultimate impedance matcher here but no it is true uh we think for example that uh, let me give a practical example when you use something like flameandmind.com for brainwave or i thrive ithr I-T-H-H-R-V-E.com, iThrive.com. When you use that to match the breadth and low frequencies of the sender to the receiver, you can measure the increase in telepathy and empathy. So for example, uh, realheartcoherence.com, we actively teach tantric lovers to match their heart harmonics. And it's beautiful and powerful way to learn love. I mean, compassion, I mean, embedding, I mean, empathy. And we famously tell a story, the largest bank in Australia, ANZ Bank Melbourne bought, well, what was then realheartcoherence.com to teach their bank managers to feel for their black clients, actually. They were teaching empathy by measurement. And that was a case of literally teaching them to match their heart harmonics. And that all starts, by the way, with breath entrainment. So, and breath entrainment is so easy and so profound. A great way for lovers or studying tantra empathy, studying telepathy. Breath entrainment is almost always step one, really. And so, uh, uh, breath entrainment, heart entrainment, uh, EKG, EEG, these are all very practical ways to, yes, you, you can send a message that way. And that's the beginnings of telepathy. It's a very appropriate question. And there are very powerful tools, for example, biofeedback to do exactly that, breath training. Uh, uh, oh, 
Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank, uh, Valerie got the answer to the question. She's a hero. <laughs> so Anton Park's book, uh, Shelley, about uh, the, uh, the Anki's lady is called Testament of the Virgin. It's a beautiful book by Anton Parks' lady about the power of the lady behind, man. It's good. It's deep. <laughs> uh, thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, next question there. Sorgman Williams asks, is there another type of slipknot than the Anu? Uh, sorry, is, is there another type of slipknot than Anu? Yeah, than the Anu. Well... Slipknot theory. I mean, my friend at the time, Lewis Kaufman, famously, I, th I think he got a Nobel Prize. He studied knot theory and found in the original alphabet of the Peruvian tribe, Aymara and Quechua, they used the shadows of the angles of slipknots for their alphabet. This is the Quechua. I spent Christmas on uh, Lake Titicaca with them, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and uh, the shadows of slipknots in rope was their alphabet. Hello. <laughs> now, if you take that slipknot and you index the spiral on that slipknot on the torus by the tetrahedron, those shadows are called Hebrew and Sanskrit. So <laughs> actually, according to physics, we don't have anything but slipknots. Oops. <laughs> Physics has nothing to discuss other than slipknots. So yes, hello. <laughs> it's all slipknots on the donuts of light. It's literally true. <laughs> so last yeah, I question. Yeah, last. Less, less, thank you. Last, last question. question from Ajda. In the book Science on Reconnective Healing, is that gamma was abundant in measurements when the reconnective healing frequencies were used by Dr. Eric Eric Peel. Do you think they talk about that gamma that you mentioned? Would reconnective healing be a way to bliss? You know, reconnective healing was famous and extremely popular with our Italian audiences. And um, I know they were talking, you know, in fact, our friends said, they're really talking about Kundalini. They just don't use the word Kundalini. And the climax of Kundalini is related to gamma. Absolutely. And uh, yes, uh, 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 you know, the people who talk about theta healing almost never bother to measure theta. <laughs> we do. Uh, and then the same thing with people who, measure, who, who talk about gamma healing. But yes, the ability to reach gamma coherently is a, in my view, a serious uh, climax and reward and success. And uh, what they call reconnection is probably a very beautiful metaphor for exactly the level at which reconnection is possible. Remember, the number of dimensions you live in is the number of axes of spinning charge that can be superposed in your aura. It's that simple. And that's called harmonic inclusiveness. And when you reach gamma, you have another whole spectrum of magnetic fields spinning coherently in your aura, which means the reconnection is broader spectrum. It's beautiful. It's powerful. And in fact, I believe, you know, they call the next dimension the number of densities, but it's literally the number of harmonics. And it's a number of, we know golden ratio harmonics times the speed of light measured by Raymond Chow is indirectly the number of dimensions you're living in because it's how harmonic rich is the compression that embeds your aura into a longer wave array. So absolutely, gamma is reconnection. I mean, it is perfect connection. It's a very useful metaphor. I love it. Okay, uh, was that a happily ever after? <laughs> thank you, Dan. Uh, there is just one uh, more question. It's a technical question about social media. Maybe Russ can help us. Uh, Fractal Nick asked, clicking Discord on Fractal U opens the application, but doesn't take me to a Discord server. Um, we might need an invitation from the um, Discord manager, I believe. Um, would Russ like to comment on that, maybe? Uh, Russ, are you still there? I think we might have yes, lost. Yes, 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 of course, of course, of course yes. Yeah. So they, do they need a special invite to the Discord server, Russ? So, so from... from the uh fractal you website fractal you.com uh you can 
from the right top side, you can press uh, join the Discord. Um, and right there, you, you, you can join all the conversations. As what I hear today, I'm actually very pleased, actually very uh, um, happy and delighted to see so many, uh, so much enjoy, uh, engagement in uh, the group chat right now. And uh, every course that we will be showing to our um, to our people, we will be uh, not only providing these courses, but we will have these types of conversations once a week. So I hope everybody joins again and we can uh, expand further. I could see that we had about 70 to 80 people at first. Now we have about 60 for the second hour. This is beautiful and I'm, I'm very delighted to see this. Well, so, that's uh, please. wonderful. Thank you. That's wonderful, Russ. So maybe, Russ, let's you and I agree that we're going to put an extra paragraph at the top um, about how to use the Discord. We're going to add some more instructions for Discord It was uh, so that it becomes easier for them because I think they're confused yeah. about the Discord. So we're going to add more Discord instructions to the website very shortly. And, okay. and okay, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll add. So everybody, guys, come on, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's 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 do this. So go inside the Fractal U website. Join the Discord. We're going to start posting more, more and more every week. Uh, all of Dan's lectures and uh, new interviews with everybody that uh, yeah. we're in contact with. So this, this is beautiful. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, Russ. And Russ, they are saying that there's an issue with the Discord link. So let's say that we're going to check that for them. Okay. So we are going to check on the Discord link, guys. Thank you, Russ. We we will fix it. And yeah. Yeah. We're, so we're gonna... all the all the social media links are. On the fractal fractalu.com website, they can find it there, like Instagram, Discord, YouTube yes. channel, and Facebook. They are all up there now. Yes, the the Facebook is there, the YouTube is there, and we're going to update the the Discord. So thank you for joining us, guys. It's been a wonderful blessing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tufan, for making the dialogue possible because I couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> it was a pleasure. The the questions were beautiful. I love beautiful them. questions, guys. More fun to come. See you next time. Yep. See you all next week. Thank, okay. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Lessons. Thank you very much, everybody. Love you guys. I really <laughs> love your smiles. It's been a delight, really. Thanks, guys. Thank you again. You're you're beautiful. You're a wonderful person. That's we had some wonderful serious energy. <laughs> blessings, blessings. So one last one last notice. Um, next week on January fifteenth, we are meeting with Iris Wizing to talk about training kids to see without their eyes. Bliss biofeedback training with young people. Hope to yeah. see you all. Yeah, bliss training with kids couldn't be more fun. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Love you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Blessings. Blessings. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.